Hello everyone and welcome back. We're going to continue the interview with John. This is part two and we're going to start off where we left off on the old one in talking about the Z8. So let's get to it. So I have to ask you, the Z8, mm -hmm. how would you think, well, I think I should step, take a step back first because you did get a Z6. Is it Z6 or Z7? Six. Z6. So how would you say the Z6 in your entry into mirrorless from the D50? What was the comparison? Or was there a comparison in your mind? Well, I got the a Z6 big, later on when the price went. It, it came way down because the Z6 II came out. So the shop had some uh, Z6s that they couldn't get rid of with a kit lens on it. And the price is like, oh, it was, it was ridiculously great. So, I, of course, I, I picked it up. Why not a Z7? Oh, no, I, I didn't want a Z7. I, I just wanted a 24 megapixel. This is enough for what I wanted it for. I just wanted a, a you know, nice walk around camera. And 24 megapixel, let's be honest, is, was more than enough for me. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember, I'm coming from D2H, was only like 4 megapixel. I remember those days. And then, you know, I nailed shots at, uh, with a D2H with 4 megapixel without a problem. It's just that you... And this is where people don't understand that it takes experience. It takes a lot of photography experience, shooting uh, wild, not just wildlife, but sports and news to be able to, to deal with it. And you, you, you can't miss a shot. Now, as far as upscaling it and making it big prints, my D2H, I, I made uh, 13 by 19 prints. I think people forget that. Not a problem. Film camera you were doing that with. You were doing it with digital yeah. and small form. So it can be done even on small megapixel cameras today. I think the younger generation always want today have that. I consider it bragging rights. Like, what's the most megapixel you have? But I have heard from some people who say that, you know, having a higher megapixel, if you shoot something out, they can crop in on it. And I get, I understand that side of it is also, but then it's like, well, you could probably use a lens that can get you closer to what you need. But of course, lens costs a lot of money as well. Something well, you know, like people uh, sometimes can't separate the trees from the woods, you see, and they don't have the experience, so they always feel that more is better. Now, 99% of the people are going to shoot with these cameras, whether it has a 100 megapixel or 20 megapixel. Or two. And, or two megapixel, and just stick it in the Facebook on social media where it's scaled down to 780 KB, kilobytes. So what are, what are we saying here? And they said, oh, that's a great picture on Facebook. Are you kidding me? Compared to the original, 99.9% .9 of it is gone. Yeah, because you've chopped out a lot of it. You know, uh, they, they chopped it out. So um, the concept of is more is better, yeah, I can. if you want it, fine. You know, that's great. If you're going to make prints uh, different, yeah. and if you're going to get make prints or you're a bird guy and need to crop, 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 Okay, that, that I get. Okay. So, John, the Z8, yeah. you told me you already placed an order for that one. Correct. Why did you order it? Well, I, I ordered it because I, won't, I want to be one of the first ones to receive it. Are you going to replace one of your cameras? Or no, 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 no. Okay. I, I know. So, what is it about the Z8 that entices you to want to be one of the first to get one? Well, I think uh, I'm, I got kind of sucked up into the hype of it, and I figure... Yeah, why not? You know, um, it might be a good uh, complement to to my Z9. Now, whether the megapixels is still debatable. They the rumors say this, and another rumor says that. That uh, remains to be seen. Yeah, nobody really knows what it's going to be. You know, you watch my channel, you see my videos. Yeah. You know, I'm you know, a video guy, and my main need for this camera is the video side of it. I love the Z9. It's nice, but when I hold it around in my hand here, this thing is a beast. I call it the beast, it's heavy. If I was shooting photos a lot, again, I like the balance, I like how it feel. But for traveling for video, the one thing for me is having that screen you can flip around and see yourself. Like we're recording the situation right now. I have a Atomos Shinobi, seven inch. That's kind of being my monitoring thing. I also travel with the Ninja, and the 5-inch Shinobi. So depending on where I am and how much space I have, one of these are coming out to help me monitor. The camera, if I'm really close to it, I can flip the screen, I can see myself. 
what I want to get to it at a point where I don't have to carry all these things around with me. Mm. It's just to have the camera, I can flip it around, I can see that it's you know picking up my eye. And even if I can't see the entire time, because you're not gonna watch the screen the entire time when you're recording. Correct. But you want to know that the technology is there. Yeah. It can track your eye and it can keep everything in focus and everything is gonna be good when it when you're done. I've had too many times with the Z6 where I have to re-record. I love this. This is kind of similar to, and I can put this up here, how the um Z, sorry, the A7R5 on this football screen. But I wish Nike kind of put the inch on this side to flip it out. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that they will do that on the Z8. Mm -hmm. Because as a person who does video, again, the screen is nice. The A7R5 is just like this one. Mm -hmm. You flip it out and you can tilt it. Mm -hmm. So for photographers, you're looking straight down the barrel of the lens right. and everything is good to go. Right. But for the video folks, having yeah. to flip out yeah. and see yourself, it's not just to record because I record just like this with the A7R5. I can't do it with the FX30 because it doesn't allow that. I have to flip out the screen. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't like that. Mm -hmm. But the photo side of it, for me personally, if it becomes a 10, 14 megapixel, sorry, 14 frames per second, I think that'd be more than enough for me for shoot. For the other guys, I think this shoots, what, 20 frames per second raw, correct? Right. And it can go up to 120 yeah. in 11 uh, megapixel. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the middle size is what? How many frames 60. per second? 60 frames per second. So, I think for most people, you probably don't need that. And a lot of the guys that I've seen in the chats and online are talking about this stuff, they do more landscape because of the high megapixel. And I think having the high megapixel gives us 8K, which this baby can do. Well, Have you ever tried I 8K? Think... No, I never tried. <laughs> I am kind of embarrassed to say, I, I think I've only turned on the video once really yeah in, in over in a year and a half you should give it a shot well how if he did a yeah show the, you saw yeah, that he's he's pretty amazing guy but I, i'm just not confident in it you know so i just if i video something i just use the iphone it looks great and i call it a day for what i video i'm not videoing anything really important right you see so um and and then my post production skills are really bad, and, they, a, I, and I'm a real elementary in doing that stuff in uh, post production. I'll tell you, I use the Range of Resolve. I find it to be one of the better software out there. There's tons of other things out there. I can show you a few things while I'm here. Yeah, we got a week right. or so, and I can show you how you know some of the stuff that I do to kind of get you started. And there's tons of videos out there. Yeah, that stuff. yeah. All of these cameras basically have a basic mode where you can just shoot. You don't have to do any color correcting. I, I guess that's something I, I have to learn about. Well, as you want to take your channel to the next level, yeah. there's a few things we can I mean, I, I'd love to be a, a movie maker. Uh, I got some great ideas for shorts and movies and things like that. And, Shoot something. Uh, one of my good friends who, who, who I mentored, mm -hmm. I mentored him when he was very young. Uh, he wanted to be a photojournalist uh, some 10 years ago. And then um, he is now uh, one of the director of photography for for Netflix and for Vice News, and, mm. and gets all the big jobs. Yeah. So through video. Yes, that's the next thing. And he carries a Sony, I don't know the name of it, but it's just gigantic monstrosity. Oh, maybe the Venice. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's huge. So the the last production of. Um, that came out March 8th on Netflix is called MH370. Oh, the Malaysian flight. That crashed. Yeah, Malaysian 370, the disappearance of the plane. So when they interviewed um, the families, uh, he sent me some pictures of the, the, the back end mm -hmm. and the amount of gear just for a simple interview was immense. Yes. Lighting skills and so on and so forth. And just so you know, guys, we're using natural light here. There's a big window here at John's place that we're using a light. There is no light kit inside this room. And if you've been watching my video, you hear me say I've been shooting inside hotel rooms and trying to bounce light with pillows and so on. Production, you need the right equipment. And depending on how good you are and how you want to do things, sometimes natural light works well. You may have to bounce some light in. 
I like this space because there's a lot of white walls and it can give us enough light. So this, you know, we want to shoot someplace outside, but I don't have light boxes or um, boards to block the light. So this will actually work that better for us. So I expect to see some videos from you, <laughs> you know. I'm going to show you some stuff about editing and we, we'll see what we can do with that and okay. get you started in that session. Something shot with this, because oh. a lot of time, people don't realize this thing shoots great videos as well. And a lot of people right now, from the last eight months or so, I've been seeing videos from YouTubers that are non-Nikon users that have been testing out this camera and saying how great it is. So what's the difference between NRAW and ProRes? Um, NRAW is Nikon proprietary version of mm -hmm. RAW. Apple has ProRes RAW, and there's Blackmagic that have B-RAW. It's basically everybody adding their own version of compression to the raw file. Oh, it's to compression. Get, yes, to get it a different size. It doesn't compress. I shouldn't say it's compression because ProRes compresses to a certain level. Raw is actually the, um, the full level of the file. It's the, the, the entire information put in there. But I guess in a certain format, because as you know, Nikon right now is being sued by RED because of the format they use for, well, the, the, not format, the way they use the compression is similar to what raw, or mm. sorry, what red patented. Mm. So there's an issue with that. And I think that's an in-camera um, compression system that they don't like that everybody else to use. In a sense, the Atomos Ninja and the external device is fine, but in-camera um, raw or any kind of stuff like that that has any kind of compression, there's an issue with red. And you guys can tell me that if I'm wrong, I'm not an expert on this one. It's basically from what I've been reading. But I know RAW is basically getting the full context of the file so you can do all kind of edit to it. When you're using compression, HR265, ProRes, and so on, it takes the file size on to make it smaller. But unless you have a good computer to uncompress it and work with it, it those files are harder to work with. But the RAW files are way larger. I did a test of this FX30, and I believe it was like one point something gig. Oh, no, I think it was several megabytes for the most compressed, like the normal um, recording. It's like the XAVC S, XAVC I, XAVC H. And it's like different versions of compression. And the intro, the, uh, the all intro, mm -hmm. is a bigger file. Mm -hmm. And then when I put it to the Ninja and use the raw file, that just way, way more bigger than like eight gigs compared to you know, like one gig for the same one minute file. I'm using that as an example, but when I check my computer, I'll put it on screen so you guys can see what it was. But yeah, raw is basically everything. No compression. So uh, my question is when you use these uh, end raws and all this, and is it just to post on YouTube? No, 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 no. You, wanna, you don't want to use raw for YouTube because- of Then, then what's, what's the point? People who are doing video production, they want to have full control over the file, the coloring, dynamic for, ranges. For so commercial on. use. Yes. But what if just the hobbyist? Most hobbyists aren't, aren't putting raw files on YouTube. It's but going they, to be too big. Because yeah, the upload but they file, still want the camera that has it. Because they, they probably use it inside their work for something else. Let's say you're a wedding photographer and you shoot something in raw. Most people are probably not going to. But if you shoot a music video for somebody and you want yeah. to do, the, do whatever you want, you can do that. Even though these guys are posting on YouTube, most of the folks are posting, they have a lot of business, another business that they're doing that requires that level of it. It's not just always young guys, like, it's got to have, it's got to have this. The people who are um, spec hounds who talk about specs, oh, spec hounds. most of those people aren't utilizing that level. But if they advance to it, you don't want to, every year a new camera come out, you're buying something new. Yeah. You have a camera that can do it, and once you learn it, then you can understand how to use it, and then you can apply that without going to another camera. So I think more people say you want to have 6K raw and all these things built in. It's to use it whenever you need to use it. Because putting it on YouTube would be crazy. Production-wise, yes, you're giving it to whoever you're working for, you're doing a commercial yeah. or something, you get a bigger file, but still, you're not giving them the raw, usually you're still compressing it, but for you to be able to edit it and get it to that level that you want the quality to be, and then you can put in like an H.265 or ProRes, and then you can send it off to the production house. Oh, okay. Now I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so don't shoot raw and try to upload to YouTube. Leave the raw stuff out of it for now. All right. All when right. you get ready to make your movie or your short, 
that may be something you want to do, but then whenever you finish with all of that and you're getting ready to give it to somebody else, that's when the compression starts. And we can get into all that off camera and so on. Okay. All right. I know we've been talking for a while, so I don't want to go too much longer. It's a lot of information John has, and it's too much to cover in just one video. So what I'm going to do is going to end this one for today. I want to thank you guys for watching the video and hope you like it. If you'd like to see another interview with John, let me know. And maybe, you know, we'll meet up in Hong Kong or something if we get a sure. chance. And if you guys are willing to watch and give, all this, uh, give this video a thumbs up and give lots of likes, subscribe to the channel. We'll see if we can get you another one. John is going to Hong Kong in a few weeks. We're thinking about passing through in a few months, but maybe we'll make a detour if yeah. you guys want to see another one and we could talk some more. If you're interested in seeing some street shooting or whatever it is, put it in the comments and we'll see what we can do for you. Thanks for watching the video, everyone. Remember, subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next one.